Okay, let's look at the watch. Uh, so it's now time to, to stand up. Uh, I, said, <laughs> I won't stand up now. Okay, uh, cryptographic basics. Um, I think the main idea, uh, or so many things, before we now present Bitcoin, we want to provide you the cryptographic basics, yeah? because otherwise we uh, have a little bit of a problem that while I'm explaining Bitcoin, I have to uh, describe the cryptographic basics. So therefore we have a small block and it may be boring for some of you which had a cryptography uh, as a lecture, but to make sure that all of you are at the same level, uh, I will teach you some cryptographic basics at the beginning. And cryptography is both needed for two purposes. One is for protecting the privacy of the data uh, and for also ensuring the, um, um, the uh, non-corruptibility of data, uh, the immutability of data, and it's also being used for verifying the ownership of information. Yeah, so therefore that you know who said what. Uh, in many of the contracts we are doing or in many of the systems we are doing, it's not only important that we know uh, that, uh, let's say, uh, the width of or the temperature in some room uh, is, has a certain value or the bank account has a certain value, but it's very important to say um, who said this, yeah? who said the temperature has this value or who said uh, that so much money should be transferred or who said that he owns so much money. Yeah? So therefore, uh, this uh, uh, signing of information, yeah, so that you write a document and you sign it by your hand and say, I certify that this is correct. You can also do with cryptographic protocols in a digital space. So therefore, we need cryptography at le different levels in these systems, and therefore, I explain it to you. Um, essentially, what we want to cover now is uh, described here. It's cryptographic hash functions. Yeah, hash functions, all of you, I think, know from uh, as a me mechanism of uh, storing information in, in algorithm and data stru structures yeah, as a helper function there. Uh, then we talk about hash pointer and hash data structure, uh, which are important now in particular with blockchains. Uh, then we talk about Bloom filters, which are also uh, based on cryptographic algorithms and digital signatures. Uh, we won't have time today because I think somewhere here we will stop. I don't know uh, from, from timing here on Bloom filters. Um, uh, we also will talk a bit about uh, the uh, effect of quantum computing. Yeah, because you know uh, most of the hash functions and cryptographic protocols assume p is non equal to um, um, np. Uh, so it's based on more or less the algorithmic complexity of uh, Turing complete machines. Um, and the question is now what happens now if we have a new paradigm of computation, for example, proton computing? Uh, maybe uh, that, are there efficient ways of uh, uh, doing. Uh, um, search for results, yeah, so for certain algorithms, quantum computing might be more efficient than classical computing. So what's the effect now on these signature schemes and hash functions? Okay, let's move first to the cryptographic hash functions. I think all of you know what a hash function is. Uh, to summarize, a hash function is, so that's a formal definition, a hash function H uh, is if it has a compression property, so H maps an input X of arbitrary finite bit length to an output of fixed bit length, um, um, and the fixed length of the output uh, is N. Yeah, so therefore we have now, if you do this visually, we have a hash function as a black box, and it provides an output value, and the output value ranges to uh, a big set of uh, output values. Let's say, for example, here, I think something like 32 characters long, uh, and then you can from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to Z, 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 which is an enormous output space, uh, but it has a limited uh, size of n output values, yeah, from 0 to n to the power of n. No, sorry, n is the bit length here, sorry. n is the bit length, it's not just the number of values, it's the number of bits here, sorry. Uh, and here it's binary, in this case it's hexadecimal values, so therefore, it looks different. Uh, it should also be easy computable. So if you have a given value, for example, a very large file with a number of zeros and ones, uh, or a, a full hard disk, it should be. Hmm? Okay. So sorry, we now have a little bit of technical issue. Um, 
Can you tell me in TweetBag if it uh, continued to work? So I see in, um, in my own Twitch, yeah. it should work again. So one second, please. Okay, seems to be working again. Ah, okay. So um, you can go back to the slides and we Okay, continue. then I would. Okay. Sorry for that, guys. And girls. <laughs> so, okay, fine. To come back, maybe I don't know when we left off. Um, so again, a hash function has the uh, nice property. If we have a bit length of n, we can create a hash value of bit length n, uh, which is now a value from this interval. Uh, we produce a fixed output space, uh, and we can have an arbitrary long input space. Yeah, we have arbitrary long, so here star, uh, files, or arbitrary long uh, file systems, or even uh, full disk. Uh, and if you now uh, compute a hash value of your disk, uh, this is a finite uh, value. Um, so that's more as a hash function. And now we want to look at desirable properties of a cryptographic hash function. So therefore, we want to have now a, sp a specific hash function, which uh, is pre-image resistance. Yeah? So therefore, the idea is that uh, uh, if h is a hash function, and for essentially all pre-specified outputs y, it's computer computationally infeasible to find x such uh, h of x equals y. Yeah, h is also called a one-way function. Yeah, uh, so what does this mean? The idea is if you know the output value, for example, the output value is, uh, let's say, a fixed value. Um, so, for example, you took an existing document um, and, um, oh, no, sorry, this is this inverted hash function. Sorry, the picture is the other way around. So if you now have a given hash value, which uh, somebody you gave, you or you computed, um, and um, so, therefore, it's impossible for you to find another value which is different. We know that it exists, yeah, because it's a finite space, uh, to fi efficiently find the other value uh, or a bit string uh, which produces uh, the same hash value. Yeah? So, that's the idea. Uh, so, that we cannot efficiently compute the inverse function of uh, the hash value. Yeah? So, that we cannot go efficiently back to the original value. That's easy. Um, the second thing is uh, what I started to explain is the second pre-image resistance. So um, the idea is that if um, you have a given x value, um, so uh, you have a given input value, for example, an uh, uh, existing document or an existing file, uh, you compute the hash value and you uh, look at the hash value. And so therefore, it's completely infeasible for you to create another file yeah, which is different from the first file, but computes the exact the same hash value. Yeah? Why is this relevant? For example, you give your uh, uh, hard disk to the repair shop, yeah, and you do a, a hash value more or less of your hard disk, compute a hash value, and you want to make sure that when you get, to get the hard disk back, you want to compute again the hash value of your hard disk, so that your mechanic didn't, uh, let's say, uh, change something there. Yeah? So therefore, it should not be possible, even if the mechanic uh, knows the hash value you computed, that he fabricates two different changes, which compare uh, that he changes one file or deletes one file, and adds some file to get the same hash value. Yeah? That's the idea that you can prove this. And again, the nice part is I'm not a theoretician, but uh, we know uh, now we have functions which have these properties, which are provable. Um, uh, to have these two properties. Another point which, be in, which is interesting is collision resistance. Uh, a hash a function h is said to be collision resistant if it's infeasible to find two values, x and y, so that uh, they are different yeah, but have the same hash value. Yeah? So it's the, the likelihood if you have two documents which have the same hash value that which are different should be low yeah, or near zero. Yeah? And in particular, it should be, um, uh, it should be uh, feasible to find two values that attached to the same output. Okay? Um, 
that's unpicked, the three important points. So if you have now these hash functions, we call them cryptographic hash functions. Uh, what are the usages uh, for this? For example, if we have a, a cryptographic uh, hash function, we could, uh, for example, um, we have this story here. We want to store information on an external hosting service. Yeah, you send data to um, say Amazon, for example, or a cloud provider. And after a successful upload on the external service, you want to free up this space by deleting that information from the hard drive. Yeah, um, and you want to later on download the data back, um, and you want to make sure that if you load it back, uh, that nobody tampered your fidelities. Yeah. So therefore, the easy way is you compute first the hash value uh, of your data, uh, upload the data to the cloud provider, and then you keep only the hash value, and you can safely delete the data. And at a later point in time, you then request from your cloud provider the data back. He promises you uh, um, well, that the data you will get back will be the same, but maybe it's, it's a different data. So therefore, you would compute again the hash value of the upload, the downloaded data, and compare it with the hash value. And if the, they both are equal, you are safe. Uh, it's very, 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 very unlikely that it has been manipulated. So you could assume that uh, your, your value documents have fully re be restored. But if there is a different hash value, you can say, uh, you can prove also to these people that uh, it was incorrect. Um, you unfortunately don't know what they deleted, <laughs> but you can show them that they more or less deleted uh, or modified some of the data uh, and you can sue them. Okay? Uh, another idea is, which is also nice, is that uh, you can hide information. Yeah? So the idea is, uh, that sometimes um, you want to have a, a secret uh, at a certain point in time, and at a later point you want to reveal the secret. Yeah? And, but you want to make sure that uh, the secret uh, you more or less had at this point in time is the one you were revealing. So therefore the idea is now uh, is that uh, you, you more or less have a secret, value x, yeah, for example, a lottery number, uh, or you want to simulate a roulette game. So therefore, you want to say, yeah, we already have a number, a roulette number we have chosen. Uh, we don't tell it to you, but trust us, we won't, won't change it. So therefore, what you're now doing is um, you ask uh, some uh, people uh, to give an value, uh, uh, a, a certain number, uh, and you can combine this certain number with your roulette value, yeah, with this, uh, this operator with these two, two vertical bars, uh, you can more or less uh, hash them together. Uh, you can combine them, sorry, and then you hash the value, and then you get an output value. Uh, and since you use a random number and your number, uh, it's not possible to more or less trace back what you choose here from the 24 numbers, yeah, because otherwise it would be very easy to find this out. So therefore, um, then you would more or less uh, reveal this value. At, at a later point in time, um, you could then uh, show the result um, and uh, make sure that at, uh, the result you're revealing here, uh, whoever, let's say, thinks maybe you chose a different Y, uh, they can, again, now, because they know the random number, um, they can now combine the random number with U of X and verify what the, what the value is. Uh, and can be very sure that you didn't cheat, yeah? so that more or less you are, this was the secret you had at that time. Okay? Um, okay, uh, another uh, thing is that you can commit yourself on a certain value. Um, so the idea is now uh, that you make a decision, uh, you commit yourself to a certain decision, let's say to buy something or to not buy something. Uh, so it's a binary decision. And again, you combine it with a random number, create a hash function, uh, and you reveal the hash function to everybody so that you more or less are bound now to your decision. Yeah? So maybe your decision is to, I don't know what, uh, to attack uh, Moscow with nuclear weapons, <laughs> something very important. Uh, so therefore you want to say we had made this decision and you want to publish it, yeah? Uh, and later on you can uh, publish uh, both the random number and uh, your decision to everybody and so therefore you can now verify um, that you didn't change your decision. 
Yeah, so that's another important point we could do, do now uh, with this, um, uh, yeah, so that you more or less um, have commitments to certain uh, facts or to certain decisions, uh, and you more or less are later on bound to these decisions, but uh, you don't reveal the decision itself. Yeah, that's important. We will also find an, another mechanism uh, which is uh, not based on uh, cryptographic alone, which is um, uh, the notion of uh, zero knowledge proofs, which also does very similar things, uh, so that you more or less uh, can com even compute with values uh, which are not revealed, and you can make sure that the computation with these not revealed values is correct. And this often sounds too magic uh, to people which are not familiar with computer science and discrete mathematics and Cryptography, but I think for you uh, as computer scientists, that's I think a, a rather plausible uh, way, and you can read the books about all these details. Uh, so therefore, I simply present you the results uh, and which functions are have the nice properties is outside of the scope of this lecture. Um, okay, um, another use case which is very uh, at first a little bit strange. Um, but is, which is used for this proof of work in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is a sort of called search puzzle. Uh, so the idea is as follows, that uh, you essentially, uh, uh, um, so a search puzzle consists of a hash function again, which computes the puzzle results. Um, and the value is the puzzle ID. Um, um, uh, so, so we have a value ID which is called the puzzle ID, and a target set Y, um, which is more or less a set of values uh, the puzzle result must have. So the idea is now um, that we do a computation. So therefore, we take now the puzzle ID and concatenate it with a value X, and the puzzle ID and the value X are hashed. Yeah, And now we change now the value X until the result of hashing X concatenated with the puzzle ID yields a value within, within the target search space Y. Yeah, uh, I think we have a picture for that. Yeah, so the idea is like follows. Um, you more or less have uh, now a puzzle ID here. Uh, and for this puzzle ID, uh, now compute the hash value, and you have an output space. And the output space could be now uh, for the hash function the whole set of possible hash values that come out. Let's say, for, for example, if you hash, have a hash value with 40, 64 bits, um, uh, we would more or less have a search space which is gigantic, yeah, from 0, 0, 0 to, uh, um, to uh, 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 no, so from 0, from 16 zeros to FFF. So we have a search space from here, which uh, takes uh, the whole uh, search space of 64-bit uh, numbers. And now we could limit the search space by saying uh, we only accept a certain subset of these values. Yeah, So they should, for example, start always with zeros so that the search space is not the full result, but a, a very tiny subset of the full space. Yeah, So therefore we can now, and the only way since it's a hash function is to, to solve this puzzle is to try out different values. Yeah, uh, 10 values, 100 values, 1,000 values, million values. We try it out, we concatenate uh, the ID values with our test value, yeah, these millions of test values. And for each of these values, we compute a hash function. And then we look whether the result, where it lands here in the in this output space, and only if we have a hit in the target space, which is limited here, uh, we have a winner. Yeah? So therefore, we now can control the difficulty of, uh, of finding the puzzle by, for example, if we say, any, let's say half of the values should be met. Yeah, so uh, the target value should be here. The probability that in the first trial we will hit this half space uh, is uh, one half, 0 0.5. Yeah, so we, with this probability 0 0.5, the first puzzle, uh, the first trial would solve the puzzle. We may have bad luck, and the value is in the other half of the uh, space. Then we have to try another number. It typically, we'll take the next number. We would increment the numbers. That's the easiest operation you could efficiently compute uh, and without having duplicates. So therefore, you would start with x. Then you would try x plus 1. x plus 1 we, you would leads to the hash function an arbitrary value, which is not predictable. And the probability would be, again, 0 0.5 that is in this space. 
Yeah? And so therefore, if you do this often enough, the probability goes to one that after a certain number of trials, you will, uh, let's say, after two trials, you would have found the result. If the output space is not the half, uh, but a quarter of the space, or uh, an eighth, or a sixteenth, or a twenty-third, uh, the time you need to solve the puzzle is grows um, uh, exponentially. Yeah? And so therefore, you can create either rather easy puzzles or very difficult puzzles by simply limiting the number of, of digits that have to be correct. And that, therefore, you would say uh, the result should start with zeros. And so therefore, you, this is your algorithm to comp compute the search puzzle. Yeah? So you have a puzzle ID, for example. Then you have a target uh, value uh, where you want to have find it. Um, and then you try out, starting with x, uh, you compute the hash value of x concatenated with the puzzle ID. You get the puzzle result. And then you look whether the puzzle result is below the threshold of the puzzle limit. Uh, and if it's so, you return x and you stop the search, or otherwise you continue the while loop with counting. Yeah? So therefore, this is the what is the pseudo code to solve this uh, puzzle. Uh, and since it's a hash function, which is cryptographic, has all these nice cryptographic uh, functions, it's a cryptographic hash function, uh, you can prove um, that uh, sometimes people have luck and they can solve that puzzle very quickly. But on average, you can now predict what's the average time to solve, needed to solve this puzzle. OK? So therefore, it's a very nice way to give a problem to somebody else that needs a lot of compute energy to solve the puzzle. Yeah? And that's more or less a proof. Yeah? So therefore, if somebody comes with a result back, uh, you not only know that he computed the result, because you'll easily verify that the result was correct, that he comes back with. But you can also be sure that he spent a lot of energy to compute this uh, uh, value, yeah? because he had to tr do a lot of trials to find it. Or he was very, very lucky. But if he wants to continuously win this game, he, on average, would need a lot of time to solve the puzzle. Are there any questions regarding the search puzzle? Um, there aren't any questions regarding the search puzzle, but we have uh, some questions to um, the hash function itself. And maybe we okay, can go and do that, mm -hmm. but because I think we are finished with hash functions for now, um, or there is one slide missing, something like that. Um, so the oh. um, a lot of people ask, um, uh, can we? Um, what is the difference between the second pre-image resistance and collision resistance? So if you go back to the slides at the beginning. Um, a lot of people wondered where the difference between the second pre-image resistance and the uh, collision resistance is. Um, and I would um, shortly explain this, how it works. Um, so in a, um, in a uh, second pre-image resistance, so the main difference here is that in the second pre-image resistance, there is given one X. So in this case, um, X is given and Y is not given for second pre-image resistance. Y is, or in this case with the slides X and X, uh, uh, slash or da dash and um, the reason why this is the case because these are two um, different attack vectors so if you want to um, break cryptography um, it's much more easier to um, uh, break collision resistance because you can control two inputs here and if you want to um, break the second pre image resistance it's much more harder because the first input the x is already given and already set so um, you can think of that um, someone sends you a document uh, which computes to a hash function, uh, to, a, to a hash, and you want to produce a same data, the same, a same document that produces uh, the, same, uh, the same hash output. It's much more difficult than you can basically control both documents. So, for example, if you want to uh, forge a document yourself, you create it yourself, you basic, basically control both um, hash inputs um, to be the same output. So that's the reason why we differentiate between these two. Now, um, I would phrase it the other way around. I would say, by definition, so you have to look where the quantification is. So we didn't write the quantification here. So for, so for a given x, for all x, uh, it's completely difficult to find a second one. So therefore, as, as Uli said, the choice with the existence quant, here it's um, a universal quantification. And here it's more or less uh, the quantification is different, it's execution quantification. Um, so therefore, by definition, these are two different functions. 
Yeah, so um, because the one has to work for all other inputs, and the, uh, for, for one given input, for, uh, for a set of given inputs, it should be infeasible to do this, and the other is for all pairs of this, it should not be uh, yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, the next question we have is, can you please explain what is the difference between a cryptographic hash function and a regular hash function? Yeah, again, a regular hash function is only something has this shortening it has two properties. It has a shortening property. You have an arbitrary long string, and it cuts it down to a fixed size thing, and you can control the fixed size. That's one thing. It has a compression property. And the second thing, it's efficiently to compute. Yeah? It, it doesn't take, uh, it's easy to go compute. Yeah? There's ease of computation. Uh, it has constant time, more or less. Now, yeah? that's a hash function. Yeah. That you, and this is a use. And, and then additionally, you might have additional. Uh, requirements uh, which we described and depending on the number of these requirements you have fulfilled you have uh, cryptographic hash functions yeah because the cryptographic functions ha have this additional property of pre-image resistance and they have additionally the uh, property of pre-image resistance uh, and they also have the property of collision resistance and then you have golden uh, uh, hash functions um, and you might also have combinations of them yeah, but for the purpose uh, of our lecture, uh, we don't want to discuss whether all collision resistant functions are already pre image resistant, and we don't discuss them. Uh, but the word cryptographic hash function describes more or less hash functions which are additionally either pre image resistant or pre image resistant, second pre image resistant, or collision resistant, or they have a combination of them. Okay? Yeah. Um... So I have to uh, scan a little bit through it because a lot of people had a uh, question because of second pre-image and uh, resistant, uh, collision resistance. We have that. And we have a question about slide eight. That's exactly where uh, we are right now. Yeah. Um, if I know the random number in the output, can I just brute force the X if the number of options for X is limited? So basically, no, 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 no. So, no. As if I know, it depends. If so, um, so the question is, I think we, we need the random. So if if I would use, if I would not use the random number, so maybe I just don't see my hand. I have to use my mouse. If I would now uh, imagine there wouldn't be a random number, then I would take x, I take the random, the hash function, and I get a hash value. Uh, and since the hash function is deterministic. Oops, sorry, it's deterministic, and I have the values in, in let's say, roulette uh, between 0 and uh, 36, yeah, I think 36. I would have 37 different hash values. Yeah, so therefore, without the, if I know the random number, um, then I could easily compute the inverse and say, okay, this was a 0 hash, this is a, two, a 1 hash or a second hash. So therefore, the trick is to combine the random number which from a lar much larger space so that the 37 values are combined with, let's say, millions of other potential numbers so that uh, you get a fixed value. Um, but if you later on, and you also can uh, um, uh, tell the random number uh, independently, but you can, since it's a hash function, you cannot with a random number and uh, the hash value go back to x. So, okay, well, then it's called hiding, sorry. Yeah, it's hiding. No, exactly. So, um, you basically, um, the, this x can be of an arbitrary um, small um, range in terms of 0 or 1, like a Boolean value. But if you have a sufficiently large number of a random number, which is unknown, then no one is able to compute it without knowing that. Yeah. Okay. We get another question about the... Um, Maybe step back to the um, um, uh, mining puzzle or search puzzle. And someone puzzle back. asked, is step the forward. Yeah, the search puzzle, yeah. Is the complexity increased by, for example, by finding a value for X that ensures that a computed hash has a fixed number of leading zeros? So if we are considering the above example, increasing the complexity would mean yeah. increasing the number of leading zeros. Exactly. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, so the idea is, uh, sorry, I didn't uh, show the animation. So, sorry. I, so the animation shows you if you try these things out, we get random shoots in this whole range of uh, uh, for 64 bit. Yeah. And so, therefore, if we limit now the target space, the green space, um, um, by having more and more leading zeros, yeah, if, it's, if it's one leading zero, it would be half of the space. Yeah? It would be the positive and the negative numbers, or the first, uh, <laughs> yeah, first half, and then the puzzle would be easy. And the, the more zeros I add, the, the smaller the search space will be, become. Uh, and if I have only zeros, I cannot solve the puzzle because no, no result will. Uh, so, uh, so the set would be empty. Yeah, if I have an empty set, the puzzle is unsolvable. Okay, so therefore, adding zeros uh, in, uh, shrinks the size of the output space and therefore um, makes it, the puzzle um, exponentially harder. It doubles the difficulty with each zero. Yes. Okay. I think that okay. there are uh, no more questions in here. And um, we can continue. Okay. Okay, so then we have uh, cryptographic hash functions. Um, uh, so the idea is what, what are now uh, in hash functions which are used uh, in practice. Yeah? And again, so here we said what are the, the properties. Uh, if you look at them as a black box, what are the properties? Uh, and now we say, what are existing algorithms to actually do them? Yeah, so this is actual code. You can look at the code, um, which is more or less mostly assembler language or C language, which does bit operations, rotation, shifting, XOR of the input values. Yeah, it's typically discrete operations, uh, often involving um, uh, rotation of bits and XOR operations on bits. Um, and Interestingly, this is a whole book, let's say, of uh, Donald Knuth, etc. Uh, what are cool functions here? And some of them uh, seem to be very difficult for humans, uh, but obviously, like with Enigma, um, uh, if you are good math have good mathematicians uh, and look at the properties of these uh, algorithms, you can find uh, weaknesses. So therefore, um, uh, there are different algorithms which you find in your libraries. You often use, more or less, for example, Java, a string, yeah, because there's a set of these fu hash functions uh, and you can choose them. And also these hash functions uh, have different uh, bit sizes. So therefore you play, play a little bit with the name of these hash functions and the size on which uh, of the hash values you want to compute. Um, and so therefore we now have collected a little bit of, uh, of stories, or, you know, of uh, tips and tricks. Uh, what are the most popular ones and what are their properties? Uh, for example, um, in the early days of the internet, the message digest algorithms have been used for uh, securing transmission of uh, messages over the internet. Uh, MD5 and MD4 algorithms, I think some of you have heard it. Um, then there are these S uh, secure hash algorithms, SHA1, SHA2, and SHA3. Uh, which, uh, again, based on the compute power, which is available to big attackers, uh, is broken. Yeah? So that they more or less can try them out simply by taking the hash value and uh, calculating back to the original value uh, so that they more or less uh, are not collision res uh, resistant uh, or that they are, uh, are not, uh, don't satisfy all of the necessary properties. Uh, okay, here's a story a little bit of this uh, SHA algorithms. So it, typically the National Institute of Technology at, in, in the US did tenders more or less uh, to say, uh, yeah, to have people proposing these algorithms yeah, because it's important that the algorithm is known yeah, because every machine has to implement them. Therefore, therefore it should be also efficiently computation, computationally efficient. It should not be a prime number search or something very difficult or taking the square root of something, but it should be something very easy to compute. Um, but on the other hand, having all these properties. Um, and um, okay, and then there are different families of algorithms, uh, but I don't want to go into the details. We're running a little bit out of time here. But if you want to Google a little bit more about them, uh, what to use, um, so then you can do this. But again, you have to do this in the future when you're in your, bit, in your job um, again, yeah, because the, the attack uh, vectors are changing, and in particular with quantum computing, we'll have some effects. 
uh, which have to be checked. But again, we have the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, if you trust them, uh, but also the German BSE, the Bundesinstitut für Sicherheit der Informationsverarbeitung, they also do these tests for the German government, etc., and publish their results. Okay, so these are now the building blocks, the hash functions for talking to have cryptographically secure data structures. Yeah? Because in the end, um, um, this is what we are interested in. We want to build data structures, in particular blockchains or Merkle trees, to, to work with uh, secure data structures. Um, okay, time is fine. So, uh, what, so, so therefore we have this idea of a hash pointer. I think pointers, all of you know, so a pointer is something that you have a, a address in, in an address space. Yeah, that's typically what you see, uh, so that you have here an address, and the address identifies a memory location in an address space. Uh, the interesting point about a hash pointer is that it, uh, um, so that it, um, it not only talks about the location where the data is, but it also talks about uh, the content, let's say, of, of the data, about the data itself. Uh, so therefore the idea is, uh, if I have a hash pointer, uh, it essentially takes a hash value of over the data that is to be encrypted. So therefore I can now identify um, uh, that you also can verify that the information you are pointing to has not been changed. Yeah? So that's the nice part uh, about hash pointers. Uh, they are not tied to an address space, but they are tied to the content of some piece of information. Yeah, even if you make copies of the content, the hash pointer wouldn't change. So therefore, we now can build data structures uh, which uh, con combine an address and, uh, and a uh, hash value. Um, um, so therefore, if we now build a, a blockchain, the blockchain consists of a, so this blockchain starts on the left, so we'd have the, 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 so it starts with the empty blockchain, yeah, which is the value zero, like a null pointer. Yeah? We have a null hash value, and a null hash value describes no data. Yeah? And if we now build the linked list, we now take yeah, the null pointer, which would be the null value here, then we have the data, and then we again we would compute the hash value over the combination of the previous hash value, in this case the, the number zero, uh, concatenated with the real data we want to store in this block. So this would be a block, a block, and the block consists of the pointer to the previous hash value and the data, it's a data block. And then we can compute again the hash value over the whole thing with the header, in this case the null pointer and the data, get a hash value, and we can combine the hash value of this with some data, compute the hash value, get this. And now we can get the hash value of the whole chain, in this case of three blocks and an empty tail. Uh, and this would be the hash value of the whole thing. And the nice part is if anybody now looks at this hash value, this hash value secures not only the validity and consistency of this, but also the consistency of this hash pointer. So therefore it also allows me to check the consistency of this data point, and it allows me to check the consistency of that data point. Yeah. So therefore, um, by only storing this hash value of the blockchain, I have full control over the immutability of this data structure. Yeah, and this is essentially what you know, how data structures in functional programming grow, that you have some tail here, and if you append now something, it's very easy for you to append something, you take the existing hash value you know, know you compute, you append the data in a new block, and you compute the hash value. So therefore all your data structures now can be cryptographically secured, uh, and this is essentially what the Bitcoin blockchain does. It has headers and it has data and it produces a cryptographically uh, in, uh, um, secured blockchain. I think that should be clear. And um, so, okay, yes, the manipulation, yeah, if we would manipulate something here, uh, this would lead to a different uh, hash value here. Uh, and this hash value would affect, uh, change the hash value here. So therefore we would see that uh, somebody tempered something here. We couldn't know what exactly has been changed, but we know there was a manipulation taking place. So therefore I wouldn't accept this blockchain uh, as the true blockchain yeah, because it doesn't conform to the data I had about the previous state of the blockchain. Yeah? So it's again the same idea. I, I, I once checked the blockchain 
And now somebody else comes with a new blockchain, which has different hash value. Then I will say, sorry, this is not my blockchain I've seen before. Uh, so therefore, uh, you did something wrong uh, and I don't trust you. Okay. Uh, and obviously now, if you're a computer scientist, once uh, you have uh, the single value, then the second thing computer scientists do, they build lists of values. And once they have lists of values, they build trees of values, yeah? binary trees of values. Yeah? And this is exactly what Merkle trees are. It's not Angela Merkel or uh, Chancellor. Uh, it's uh, another person which more or less uh, um, invented this data structure and we therefore has this name. It has the very same uh, idea that you now have a lot of data you have. Uh, and as a data structure, you can either have a linked list, which uh, requires you to walk uh, in linear uh, time complexity over the data structure. Uh, you cannot jump. Uh, but as soon as you have a branching data structure, like the minimum uh, binary tree, or uh, let's say with a larger fan out data structure, then it allows you to navigate uh, to the different points in your data so here, points here. So therefore, if it's a four data points, you can compute the hash value of this data point, uh, it's the hash value here. So these are the leaf hash values. And then you can build a binary tree, which more or less computes now the hash values out of these hash values. Uh, and uh, then you go up to get the hash value of the whole tree. Uh, the benefit is now, if you do some mutation somewhere, for example, you may mutate something here, uh, you only have to recompute re the hash values to the root of the data structure. So therefore, uh, you don't have to look at this again. Yeah? Whereas if you have a linear list, uh, you have to walk through the whole list to recompute the hash value of the data structure. Yeah? So that's the idea of a uh, Merkle tree. Um, so therefore, it's very efficient, more or less, to search in this data tree. Um, so it's easy to recompute the hash value if you change something. And you also can easily check whether a certain block is contained in a Merkle tree by looking now at these hash values and work up. Um, it's also uh, easy to prove that a certain data block is not contained in a sorted. Uh, so if you have a sorted Merkle tree where the values here are sorted, uh, then you can do, again, binary search uh, to find out whether a block is not stored in the Merkle tree. Um, okay, how does this, well, I think the idea should be clear, and now we talk how this is done. Any questions so far? Uh, we have a oh. small question um, um, regarding the blockchain itself. Uh, would the whole blockchain mm -hmm. be invalid if one of the blocks gets manipulated? Yeah, definitely, as I said, so, if, so that's shown here. If there's a manipulated data, this manipulated data would lead to a different hash value here, and a different hash value here in the header would lead in the combination of this manipulated header with the unmanipulated data here to manipulate a different hash value. So therefore, here you could detect that uh, somewhere in this very long blockchain there was a manipulation. Okay, no further questions from Tweetback, as far as I can see. Yeah. And the same thing would happen in the Merkle tree. Um, so uh, again, you would have more hash values, but you have a binary tree. So therefore, um, if you manipulate something here or, or change something here, the manipulation would propagate towards through the parents to the root. So therefore, any change in one of these leaves would uh, lead to a change in the root hash. OK? So. So now, how does this work of membership work? Uh, um, so if you want to make sure that a certain block is uh, contained in a Merkle tree um, without hashing the complete tree, um, so we uh, look only, for example, we want to now look whether data three is contained in a Merkle tree or, or not. Yeah? So therefore, we would compute now the hash value of three uh, and uh, we would then compute the hash values um, for the higher levels, combine them, and walk up the tree. Yeah? So therefore, the height of the tree would be log of n. And so therefore, we would need log n steps uh, to validate um, uh, whether this data value is contained in this uh, data structure here. Yeah? So if somebody gives me this data point and says, is it really in the Merkle tree? Then I would go in this Merkle tree, compute the hash value, 
and compare co compute it up to the root. Okay, so because I know the data point. If I don't know the data point and it's sorted, uh, then I can more or less walk from the root down uh, along the sorted data structure and find whether it's there or not there. Uh, if I don't find it, like in the binary tree search, um, I would say, no, it's not contained in the tree because it has to be at that position. And if it's not there, uh, it's not contained in the tree. Okay. So uh, let's look at the time. Now we can move on to Bloom filters. Um, so again, uh, the idea is now um, that uh, what we also use a little bit in the Merkle tree, that um, if you have some data structure. One second, Florian. Yeah. And we move back to Merkle trees because we got a question. I think that's quite relevant. Um, so um, people wonder what these notation of in the hash one. Um, if you mm -hmm. look on the right, there is the notation of age um, one minus zero plus one minus one. Um, yeah. That seems a little bit um, confusing. So maybe we can elaborate on that, what that exactly means. Yeah, I think the idea is so there's a numbering scheme. Yeah, so if you go left, if you go from the root, then this is hash zero, this is hash one, and this is hash zero zero, this is hash zero one. Um, you know, that's a coding more or less here uh, of the uh, nodes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's more or less left and right. Yeah. So therefore, if you want to, so the idea, if you want, want to encode a path in the tree, you would say it's a, a sequence of uh, left and right turns, and if you go zero, you go left. And if you have a one, you go right. So therefore, if you want to point to some node in this tree, you simply give a bit, a, a bit string, and the bit string leads you to some inner node or to some leaf. Yeah. Yeah. So so also, um, these are not um, uh, these are not mathematical functions. It's uh, just a what I did. Um, it's basically a a um, just, just a naming scheme. So no math in here, but more or less concatenation of hashes. And um, yeah, I maybe I need to um, enhance this a little bit so it's uh, to be better understood. Again, so the goal here is not to do mathematical proofs. It's just to give you the intuition why it's the case. And if you don't trust my very short description, <laughs> which is also not mathematical, then you have to go to the textbooks. Yeah. But because we have to scope somehow the lecture, because otherwise the lecture has a very long block about cryptography, which I think in the end is not the core learning objective of this lecture. No, but no, I think it's important yeah. for me. Yeah. So therefore, here the idea is uh, that visually, uh, this is what the algorithm does, that it more or less concatenates here. That's the concatenation, uh, what we have previously had with the two uh, vertical bars. It concatenates two values, and the values are here given by two numbers. But you should, would write something like node number, node underscore something yeah if you do it mathematically yeah okay no, so, so, so it's not it's it's not yeah that's true okay and um yeah that's that's it for now okay now we go to the bloom filters um and this leads us a little bit into the way we already had a little bit of a search puzzle yeah um so in the search puzzle we also had the idea if you want to solve the puzzle, uh, you cannot predict how long it takes to solve the puzzle exactly, but you can give a very precise probability what will happen. Yeah, and I think if, if you follow the developments in algorithm theory, I think most of the algorithms nowadays are probabilistic algorithms, yeah? because if you accept a certain level of uh, incorrectness, um, then uh, with a certain level of incorrectness, uh, this is sufficient for many algorithms in reality, you can achieve uh, exponential, uh, not exponential, uh, order of magnitude impact uh, speed uh, uh, or size reduction. And that's then again the idea of Bloom filters uh, that you now have a probabilistic data structure uh, which allows you to, which is optimized for some certain way of query. Yeah? Um, so, so a Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure which allows to test if an element is a member of a set. Yeah. Um, so typically, if you have algorithmic data structures, uh, you would say, uh, if I have a set representation, I want to have an operation to add elements to a set efficiently. I want to remove elements efficiently from a set. And I want to test membership uh, of an element in the set. Yeah. So we have three operations. 
But if you say, uh, I don't care whether they can insert elements or whether they can remove elements, I want to simply test whether an element is in a data structure, then you can exploit this and say, okay, so I have a very good heuristic to find this out with uh, a very efficient data structure uh, and with a very, in particular with hash uh, functions. Yeah. So therefore, this doesn't work for arbitrary set representations because you know set representations would be linked lists or uh, tree uh, representations of sets here or a hash a representation with uh, hash data structures. Now we use Bloom filters. So um, the idea is now um, uh, that you normally would represent the set with all its values um, and you want to now look whether the value line is in the set and then you would have a data structure like a linked list or a, a tree or a hash data structures to do this. Huh? Uh, let's say find out line is now indeed part of the set. So therefore you would iterate this in this pseudo code which looks a little bit like JavaScript. Um, you would iterate over all elements in the set and you do a comparison of the searched element with the current element and then you would return true. Um, so, um, so, but you also have data structures where you don't want to insert and uh, update, uh, but where you simply want to find something out. Uh, one example is um, that uh, you want to um, have a recommender system on a web page, yeah, so that you want to recommend users pages uh, that are relevant to them, which but uh, you want to avoid to send them to recommend them always the same pages. Yeah? So where you would recommend them the page, uh, and then you want to say, uh, now recommend something else. Yeah? So, so, rec so if you want to recommend something, and then you want to compare whether the set of pages the user already has seen, um, uh, the newly recommendation is already in the set you have rec recommended before. Uh, and since you don't want to store very long lists for all your users, you now use a probabilistic data structure uh, because you say, okay, it may be the case that my uh, data structure says he, he hasn't seen it before, but indeed he has seen it before. Yeah? So that would be a typical use case where you could live uh, not only with the fact that you cannot insert and delete, but you can also live with the fact uh, that your uh, search, the result would be in very rare cases wrong. Yeah. Um, so therefore, this is now the idea, the problem. Uh, and there the, you would use Bloom filters. Uh, um, so what is a Bloom filter? A Bloom filter, yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, so, so this is now the cliffhanger now. <laughs> Let me make it a cliffhanger. Uh, so that's now the problem you want to solve. You want to have a membership test, which is probabilistic, uh, on a data structure where you don't want to do um, uh, uh, removal insertions, uh, it's only a, a limited data structure. Fine. If there are no more questions, then uh, I think you're ready for the next exercise. Um, and Uli would do it again. Uh, and I do hope the quality of Twitch was yes. fine and also you didn't have problems with the IT setup. I am in a lucky situation, I only see my slides and my webcam. I don't see your Twitch uh, feedback, uh, but Uli gives me feedback if something is wrong. So goodbye and see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Get this here, then a little bit the resolution should increase. Very good. Like this. Okay. So um, cryptographic basics, we talked about it already um, last week. We were not quite close. Um, so guys, it does not work if you are not muting yourself in Zoom. Okay, done that. Um, very good. Um, so cryptographic basics, um, very important topic, as I already told you last week. Um, and I think uh, we covered everything except for Bloom filters. So I think that's a very important topic. So not very important, but um, I think it's a quite nice uh, data structure and a probabilistic data structure. And understanding it will give you a little bit of an idea how, or I would say it's a, it's a tool in your toolbox to solve issues in blockchain that might arise. 
and um, it's quite often used actually in blockchains and in Bitcoin. So maybe um, that's also a good hint. Um, so a Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure which allows us to test if an element is a member of a set. And um, usually that's a very simple task. So you have like a set S in here. Um, and um, these are some fruits here and you have an element and you check um, if you want to check if this element is in this set and um, that's quite easy so you can do it like that um, not too not too important um, how you how it's exactly implemented so there are um, experts on that how you um, create an optimal function for that but basically um, the larger the set gets um, it's more and more computationally ineffective to or inefficient to search through the complete ele to complete to, to, through this complete set and find your element or check if it's in there or not. And um, one second. And um, so, so that's the that's the first that's the first um, first topic in here, and um, so that's quite inefficient. We know that for a fact right now. And um, how can we optimize that? So how can we uh, think about enhancing this and um, yeah, making this a little bit more speedy? And we have an exercise or a simple example here. And um, this example is uh, um, taken from medium.com. So they have a nice, a nice article about that. I don't know why I missed the citation here. That's, um, I have to look it up because there is a, a story about that, how they use Bloom filters in their system. And I um, adopted a little bit the story from them. So you are a web developer for the website of a newspaper. At the bottom of each article, the website displays um, recommended articles to read for the user. The algorithm for good recommendations works fine already, however, does not take into account if an article has been read yet. If it has, um, it should not be displayed. With thousands of individual users each month with uh, read many stories over time, storing all reads and testing if an article is in the set is too slow for a good surfing experience on the website of the newspaper. So what should we do? So that's really the, 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 it's a very good example how bloom filters are used in a daily life and how good they work. So you can imagine you have users which read like 10, 20 um, articles a day. You have thousands of users. So this database where you say, okay, um, user X has read story Y grows quite large and uh, scanning through this and reading through this uh, or, or doing some kind of a, a search in your database is really really exhausting and takes a lot of um, computational amount and that's really not necessary and this is where the bloom filter comes into into place and i created these slides um, so that you have a little bit of an understanding how it works or how this data structure could look like so um we have a we have a filter the bloom filter itself um, consists out of baskets so we have here 16 baskets and um, when they are white they are basically um, um, zero or can be um, um, seen as zero and when they are black here then they equal to one so um, that's the basis the basic structure here and um, a bloom filter basically um, has a set of hash functions or, or has some hash functions. This um, number of hash functions can be arbitrary. So it can be one, two, three, it can be many more. In our use case, we use uh, three hash functions here. And um, these three hash functions are MD5, SHA1 and SHA2. So you might be a little bit surprised because um, MD5, Uli, you told us, um, that's garbage, please don't use this anymore. And um, that's true, you should not use this um, for as a cryptographic hash function, but um, you can use this for a Bloom filter because the hash functions in Bloom filters are usually not um, 
they don't require the cryptographic hash functions, so uh, the properties. So you could use any hash function you would like in there. So it's not really it's not really necessary to rely on these um, cryptographic crypt cryptographic hash functions here. And um, what this uh, what what we can do is with a Bloom filter, we have two stages. Basically, we can fill it up, so we can add members or we can add elements to the set, and we can search. Um, the second step, so to say, we can search for um, elements within this um, within this Bloom filter. So that works quite good. Um, the what you have to be careful about is that this um, membership verification or this um, query, if a element is a member of the set, it there are two possible outcomes: either a true which says E possibly in the set of S or false E definitely not in the set of S. So that's a property which allows us to say, okay, um, it's not, it's probabilistic, so it's not always correct. So E possibly in this set means that if the answer of the query is true, there is a slight or small or there is a non and a, a, a chance that E is not in the set of S while the query returning true. So that's uh, that's important here. Um, so let's take a look at the internals here. So we have a um, set information. This is the set S. So it's empty now. This is the element E we either add or search for. We have the hashing results. So we take the five um, um, uh, these three hash functions here, MD5, SHA1, SHA2, and we only take the first character of it. So we could take more obviously, but for the sake of simplicity and for the sake that you can try it yourself. So this is really an example that works and uh, you can basically play it yourself. Um, uh, then it's uh, then it's definitely uh, very useful, I think, for you. So um, you have the explicit state here, and you have always a box down there which describes each step, what's happening. So we have a filter setup. We have the filter is initialized with n buckets, so from zero to n minus one. So from in this case, we use a hexadecimal notation because also our hash functions return hexadecimal um, outputs or have hexadecimal outputs. Um, the hash functions are defined so we have defined our three hash functions here and now we take a look we add the element apple here so apple a very uh, simple fruit everybody knows of you and i would take now i look to have some kind of a um, uh, online hash generator um, so that you know um, what's going on So, for example, this is let me let me switch here to Chrome, and we have the this is an MD5 algorithm, and we now put Apple in there, and hopefully, it returns 1f38. And as you see in here in the PowerPoint, and when we switch back, it's also 1f38. So you can put it yourself into a into these calculators and try it for yourself. I won't do this for every step. You have to believe me that these are the correct values here. Um, so the explicit ch state now changes because we have basically um, the uh, values or the returns from our hash functions if we put apple in there. So it's one, d, and three. And now we have to, to set the corresponding buckets to one. So in this case, one is set now to one, uh, D is now set to one, uh, to one, and three is also set to one because we, alum, we added the element apple. The next step, the same for lime. So we have six, D, E, and so on. So there are, I just omitted these um, values here. And as you see, we have now um, new values which do not overlap with the previous ones. So six is set to one, C is set to one, E is set to one. Um, so now we have in our set, apple and lime. 
So this is just for us the information. Um, we other other parties only see the state of this bloom filter here. And then we add a third element, lemon. So we see 3DF. So if you're watched carefully, we already had um, 3 and D um, already, already there in the set. So only F has to be added. So if a hash function hits again a bucket, which was also already set to one, then it remains at one. So that's, um, that's the idea here to say, okay, um, it remains here uh, um, because we will see the reason why. So I think now our um, our addition is finished. So we added our three um, fruits here, and now we want to search for these um, fruits. And the first one is apple. So we search um, if the um, element apple is in there. So we know for a fact that apple is in there, but let's see what our bloom filter returns. So again, we take this apple, hash it, so 1d3 again returns the three hash functions, and we check the corresponding buckets here. So 1 is set to 1, 3 is set to 1, and d is also set to 1. So this um, enables us to say um, the apple is actually, we found um, the apple within the bloom filter. What does a yes mean? We already heard that before. A yes means E possibly in set S. So we know it because we added Apple beforehand, but um, right now um, we, um, but only, only knowing the bloom filter, we cannot reliably say that it's actually in there. And you see in a second why. So let's now check a uh, element which is not in there or which we did not add before to the bloom filter. So let's take the mango. Mango has A96. And now we check A is empty, 9 is empty, and 6 is set to 1. Um, so what we know is when you want to have a match, then all buckets have to be set to 1. So all the buckets you find here would, be have, would have to set none, to none. So what we now know is that the mango, the mango is not in there. We definitely sure know for a fact that the mango was never added to this uh, bloom filter. So that's very, that's very um, powerful here because we know it was never there. And now we have a third fruit, uh, the grapefruit. And we never added the grapefruit here in the set uh, beforehand, but now let's check the bloom filter. So. Um, when we hash it, 6, F, and E is um, outputted. And let's check these. So 6 is set to 1, F is set to 1, and E is set to 1. So our bloom filter returns true because um, all the buckets are set to 1, which we looked for. And now we have a false positive. So our bloom filter returned true. E, so the element is possibly in the set, but it actually was not. So that's a false positive here. So um, that's a little bit the downside of these bloom filters. Um, so so that's that's really what what I mean or what is meant by um, this here true E possibly in the set of S, but it could be if you are out of luck if um, there are some, if your chances are not good, then it could be um, set to true um, despite your object not being in there. And um, so now we know how we um, we'll get, get going back to the recommended article topic. Um, now we know for a fact that um, in a news page, we can basically store for each user a bloom filter. So, um, and um, every time a user um, reads a story, we add this hash of the story, hash of the title, hash of the ID, I don't know, some unique identifier um, to this bloom filter. And every time 
we want to recommend some articles to the user, we check the filter. So we input these stories um, to, uh, we, we search with the, source, the story ID we want to display in the Bloom filter. And if there is a, a true, so that the user might have already um, read the story, then we do not display the story. And if it's false, then we display the story and store it in a filter. And that's now the um, big question. Um, why are false positives not a problem in this case? And I'll um, write this in tweetback and you maybe can answer that or also people from um, Zoom can speak up if they are interested in. Um, yeah, why are false positives in this case um, positive as in this case not a problem and um, maybe you have an idea about that why isn't it a problem in this case anyone from sue no one so you have to speak up i won't call you um because i think that's not the intention of that Um, so, uh, we got some answers there. Um, first of all, um, I'll just, um, um, repeat them. There are enough, enough other articles because in articles, nobody really has to read them because we know about them showing an article that he, she already has read is not of the end. It's not the end of the world of the. Sorry, I'm hearing myself because people don't mute themselves when they come in here. I'll have to see if I can enable that, disable that. Okay. Um, so, um, because it's better than nothing, we are only concerned with showing articles that had not been read, false positives filter out article, but also ensure that there is no chance a previously read article appears. And so on and so forth. So, so many, um, many answers there, but the last one is actually, um, the correct one. So, um, I think some of you also meant that, um, so a false positive in this case leads to a scenario where, um, an article which has not been read. So he was unfortunately, um, a false positive and gets filtered out of the system. And um, that's really a, that's really not an issue because a um, user, which, um, which does not get, which does not get an article display displayed, which he didn't read is totally um, irrelevant for the user experience. So the user only gets really displayed what he has not read. That's guaranteed because of the uh, negative, the, so if the bloom filter answers no, then it's definitely true. And if the bloom filter answers yes, it's only a um, possibly in the set. So this is removed and um, the user does not, does not know that an article was removed he did not read about yet. So that's um, the issue here. And um, yeah, so that's, that's about, uh, um, that's about the, um, the bloom filters so there is no downside to the false positives as it eliminates articles which have not been read by the user da 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 so that's about bloom filters i think now we can answer some questions about the bloom filters and then we continue with um 
the exercise sheet. Okay, so if we add about um, the first one, if we add about 100 elements to the bloom filter and every bucket is set to one, then why can't, uh, then we can't say anything or is there a solution for this? So um, these exercises or these examples we do here also for uh, the Merkle tree or for the um, hash parcel, stuff like that, they are only very small examples to give you an understanding of how the system works. So, um, I have no certain number or have no direct number how large these bloom filters get, but they are um, 200, 300, 400 bits long. So they are much, much longer than what we do here in the example. So um, therefore, um, this is a very small bloom filter, but there are uh, much larger bloom filters which do not have this issue. Um, Next one, how does using one digit from three hash functions differ from using three digits from one hash function? Um, very good question. Um, in this case, actually doesn't because um, we need some, yeah, we need some reliable entropy. So we need to have a function which tells us exactly um, what, is, uh, what is going on there um, and reliably, um, outputting the same value if we put it in. So we need some kind of um, yeah, reliability there. Um, but determinism, that's what I, uh, what I was looking for. Um, but in reality, um, these hash functions are used uh, um, as uh, the, the complete output of the hash function is used. We only use one digit um, because of simplicity reasons, but uh, usually they are used in total. Uh, what is a good number of baskets to reduce the chance for false positives? I don't have an answer to this because it depends on how many elements you want to store, how many, um, 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 what is your, what are your storage requirements, stuff like that. So um, I have no, I have no answer to this, and um, I, I searched on the internet so to provide these answers uh, for you, um, but there is a little bit of lack of um, literature out there. So. Um, you can always assume there are sufficient um, baskets of uh, baskets for bloom filter. Just to check, there cannot be false negatives in bloom filters, right? Because if any of the three hash function hash checks fail, our element is definitely missing. Exactly. So um, there cannot be false negatives. There only can be false positives. Um, then we have a question which has a very good point. Why is the story displayed and stored in the filter? User could not also could also not clink, right? Yeah, that's correct. That's um, so it, uh, um, it's there. It's or it's added. The story is added to the Bloom filter when um, they read it, not when they get it displayed. Yeah, I need to I need to fix that. Um, how should we choose the number of hash functions? You don't have to. Um, we don't, we, we don't, you don't have to do, you don't have to decide upon parameters of bloom functions. So, or the bloom fun bloom filters. So that's not really important. Um, for me, it's important that you understand the concept of it so that you know, okay, how do they work? But, um, it's not really important to say, okay, yeah, Uli now wants me to know exactly how much, um, how much baskets I need. So that's not, that's not required. You can always assume if I ask in an exam questions like that, you can assume that the number of baskets, the numbers of hash functions is, um, is, um, sufficient for our, um, yeah, intentions. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think that's that's about it. Um, all the other questions which now arise, I think I have already answered them. So um, please just look in the recording again. Um, because so these are all questions in in terms of um, can what can we do with the hash functions? Um, how many do we need? Um, so 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 all changing these all these parameters is not really important. You re you only need to understand the concept of it, um, so that you. Um, basically add elements to the uh, bloom filter and then you search for it. 
and that it's uh, that it po um, false positives are possible and false negatives are not possible. So that's the important part here. Okay. Possibility to ask questions regarding all these topics we covered last week. Uh, I want to continue today with the uh, uh, cryptography basics. Um, uh, moving on to the digital signatures, uh, where which are important in uh, uh, yeah, for different purposes, also traditionally outside of the Bitcoin world, for signing information, yeah, to prove that a certain person uh, signed a document. Yeah, you know, the idea is if you sign a classical document, this is the proof that you wrote the document and yet that you read the content and you agree with the content. Now, if you go to the notary, that's very important. Um, and the same thing has to happen in a Bitcoin-based system. So therefore, also signatures uh, are used to prove that you are the owner of some messages or the owner of some documents. Okay, so um, what is a digital signature? Um, they are based on the notion of asymmetric cryptographic. Uh, and there are two algorithms, the RSA algorithm and the ECC um, algorithms. Uh, here, these are the names of the inventors. Uh, actually, I don't know where blah, blah, Abelson, whatever. So the, the three uh, first letters of the last names of the authors and the elliptic curve uh, algorithms. Um, so we don't want to know how they work. Uh, we, let's say, but we again want to have this block box knowledge. What can you do with them? Uh, and uh, the important point is what you want to achieve is that only one person can create signatures, namely the owner based on the private key and everybody can verify uh, that it belongs to the owner because the owner publishes, publishes the public key and with the public key you can verify uh, that it really has been signed by this person. On the other hand, you cannot use the public key to create uh, signed messages, so therefore it's asymmetric. Yeah, so that's uh, the difference with symmetric and asymmetric keys. Um, and again, uh, obviously, uh, if you have a document and the signature, it has to be attached to the document. You have to say this signature belongs to this document uh, because uh, that's important that you cannot reuse the signature and copy it out. Uh, let's say copy and paste with Photoshop or take the signature out. So therefore, the, the, the signature uh, result more or less depends also on the uh, content of the message. And so therefore the idea is now rather simple once you got the idea, if you know that you have these uh, public key schemes, that you use the hash value of the document. Yeah? So you'd have a document, you take the hash value and then based on the uh, hash value, you can then um, sign the message. So that's the idea uh, uh, using the uh, uh, public key. So therefore, uh, to summarize, the digital signature scheme works as follows. We have three algorithms, uh, an operation to generate keys. Yeah, and this is specific. It depends. There are different generation key algorithms for the RSL uh, scheme uh, and the elliptic curve scheme. But uh, you essentially define the key size. Yeah, and the key size is a measurement, let's say, uh, how difficult it should be to, um, to uh, create uh, the keys. And if it also uh, um, controls the difficulty to uh, try out uh, to recover the keys by brute force. Yeah? So therefore, this is a parameter you can use, and this is most appended to the letter of the algorithm. Okay, um, so therefore, the general keys operation gets the key size, and be on, and then you, it returns a pair of a secret key and a public key. So that's the result, more or less, a pair of values is the result. Uh, and you use the public key and give it to everyone. You publish it on your web page or uh, in a public directory, um, or you send it in emails um, where people can verify that they are from you, or you print it on paper and pass it around. Yeah? So that's the idea. It should be uh, easily accessible to other people. Or you, other people, you can send it by emails when other people request it. Um, then you have a signature operation, which takes essentially the message or the message digest, uh, a hash value of the message, uh, signs it, take, and takes the secret key and computes the signature. Um, and this is the signature which you then attach or pass on together with the message. Yeah, so therefore, this signature depends on the message. It's not depending only on the secret key, but on the combination of the secret key and the message. And then the receiver gets now the message. Uh, it can be plain text, uh, the full message. And then he can take uh, the message or then compute first the hash value of the message uh, and then take the private key um, 
the, sorry, public key uh, and the message signature, and then passes in these three parameters, and the verify operation, which is again depending on RSA or ECC algorithm, uh, checks whether it's valid. It's Boolean true or a Boolean false. Yeah? Um, and so that's a nice point, uh, that if the result is really true, you can be sure uh, that uh, it has been signed by the uh, original person. Um, yeah, so, so unfortunate means, uh, and that can be mathematically proven, which is not our job today, uh, that you can prove for these algorithms if you know the public key, uh, at least you see the signature, and an arbitrary amount of messages. Uh, that was a tech vector in the Second World War with the Enigma. If you have enough messages and you do it, um, and you get all the same messages, yeah, you have let's say messages of uh, submarines and you, uh, the submarines, you can control where the submarines move, uh, then you can generate messages and let them sign. And then if you look, then you can sometimes with some algorithms which are not nice, you can then compute back, if you have enough messages, uh, come back to the original, um, to the uh, private key. So, uh, and this means more or less that you cannot create signatures on a message that he has not been seen. Okay, again, a nice feature which is used in many banking applications, in many uh, uh, identity management solutions uh, for signing stuff. Um, again, I mentioned already that two different major groups, the RSL-based, uh, Rivers, Chami, and Edelman, uh, these are the authors, 1997. Um, that was just when I was at, uh, at the university, and that was a big news that this would be possible. It was a big, I think they also got the Turing Award for that. Uh, and the basic idea of this algorithm is that it's, uh, if you have specific large numbers, um, it's, it's uh, easy to create them, but it's difficult to uh, find the prime. The, so you take two, two, two uh, um, uh, here for two large prime numbers, you multiply them, and it's hard to find out what are the two factors uh, which yield the result. Um, there are newer versions um, of, of uh, which are now more fa famous models are the um, electric uh, curve algorithms um, and uh, they also have a longer history models here. Um, okay, and again uh, the uh, German uh, Bundesamt für Sicherheit der Informationstechnik, something like the uh, 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 a security agency for each stage had, has more or less a security agency which gives recommendations to the military and recommendations to the public authorities, what key length are safe. Uh, and that changes over time with the uh, increasing compute power. If you have supercomputers, it's easier to break, for example, to do um, uh, factorization of uh, large numbers. Uh, and so therefore currently uh, the key size are 2,848-bit for these, these algorithms and for the elliptic, for this specific class of the ECDSA, uh, it should be at least 256 bit. And I mentioned this because uh, this algorithm is be used, used by Bitcoin. Yeah, because otherwise outside of the Bitcoin world is not so much used. Uh, uh, but here the idea was to have something with a co compact key, key size, which is shorter than the uh, uh, RSA keys. Um, yeah, again, if you want to create now, uh, sorry, so, um, so if you generate keys, you need some source of randomness more or less, yeah? Uh, so that for a given key size, you get different values. So, so if you either enter some, some random, some sorted value here, or you have a source of randomness implicitly. And this is typically done that you have, can, you can buy tables of random numbers that have been generated by, uh, by, um, uh, natural phenomena yeah, like uh, radiation or um, yeah, pings from uh, radioactive material um, so that they are truly uh, provably uh, random. Uh, so it's, that's important um, and therefore you also should always introduce, let's say, if you do something, uh, some movement of the mouse, etc., that cannot be forged uh, by other people. Uh, you should also um, sign also a small amount of data. Yeah, so therefore, typically what you do, you first hash the message and then you sign the hash of the message. Um, it should be also important that you keep your private keys uh, private. 
Um, so therefore, um, that's also one important point that uh, you, it's not like a password or that you have a, uh, some other means to go back to the bank and say, yeah, you have a key, copy of my private keys, um, but that's not being done in the digital uh, equivalent. So therefore, that's recoverable and you have to get a new pair of, key, of keys. And as you will see later on, if the keys are the means to identify your bank account, uh, that is very, very difficult, yeah, that you more or less, once you've lost your keys, all your money is go gone, uh, unrecoverable, you cannot go to the bank and do some uh, claims there. Yeah. Again, uh, as I mentioned, the key length, uh, you could be, you, you have a free choice how to do this, like MP3 files, yeah, you can either have very short uh, MP3 uh, quality or low quality, uh, then you can, can compress it very much. Uh, but I think uh, if, since it's all about security, uh, you should go for larger key sizes um, in your algorithms. If you design them yourself, or if you look at existing Bitcoin uh, uh, blockchain solutions, you should make sure what is their key length, uh, how secure are they to uh, attacks. Um, okay, so that was most the idea using digital signatures to say, this is a document I created and somebody else can uh, create, find out whether I created it. Um, there are also schemes where multiple people can sign something, but these are variations of the same idea. Another uh, uh, use you can use for digital signatures is uh, to use them as identity systems. Yeah, so therefore that uh, you, because typically if you go to Facebook, you identify yourself with your email address, or if you go to the state of Bavaria, you identify yourself uh, either by your um, home postal address, uh, that you want to uh, verify that you're living right now in this apartment. Um, and that's in, in Germany the best way to do this. Uh, so because there's a very strong bookkeeping about who lives where, uh, and that's heavily tracked by all kinds of authorities. So therefore the, the who has access to your mailbox or uh, in, 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 in your apartment, this is you, that's the assumption. Uh, so you're identified essentially by the mailbox you are owning in the physical world, or if you more or less move around or you are found, you need your birth certificate. Yeah? So therefore, somehow you are identified either with your birth certificates, uh, from which you derive your passport or your thing, uh, or you derive from your actual current location. And now the question is, how do you identify people in the virtual space? And again, one idea is now to use digital signature schemes as an identity system. So therefore, essentially, you use your public key or hash value of your public key as your identity, uh, which allows you more or less to uh, more or less identify your location. Yeah. So uh, or your yeah, so your unique identity. Yeah? Because that's the idea. There's only one post box in, uh, for me, uh, and, or may, there may be even multiple post boxes, <laughs> but um, I only have access to the post box. Yeah? And if somebody sends me a letter, and uh, uh, the assumption is, or if somebody, the, uh, the mailman gives me a letter, uh, this proves that I'm myself. Okay. Uh, and so therefore we use now the public key or the hash of the public key as my identity. And the secret key is more or less a password, which allows me more or less um, to identify myself. Yeah, that this is really my post box and not somebody else's post box. Uh, this has some nice advantage um, because you don't need something like street names that have to be unique or directories that if you invent a new email address, that your email address is, there doesn't have to be a central directory of your email addresses because if somebody creates a new email account on Facebook, uh, they don't should not use your email address. Yeah? And therefore, if people use now their very cryptical uh, public key or public key hash value, you can run this randomly create arbitrary amounts of new identities with the generate keys function. Uh, and this way, uh, more or less, you can also uh, have uh, multiple, uh, a lot, large number, let's say, of identities which you are working in the universe. Yeah? Maybe you have a private identity where you do all your um, uh, jobs, things with the family, uh, or what you do for a private life. Then you have a, a, boss, a business identity, as say, as the student of Tom, or you have a second uh, business identity as an employee of another company, and you keep them separate. Yeah? So therefore, if money flows between these accounts, uh, it cannot be identified with you. Yeah? Um, there is obviously a, a footnote here. Yeah, so as long as you always identify yourself with your um, 
with your public keys or with your online identity. Uh, but as soon as you then do some transaction, let's say you show up in a certain bank or at a, um, at a supermarket and you pay now with your wallet ID, then more or less somebody can take pictures of you and can trace you with a detective that follows you home uh, and find out, let's say, who you are. Yeah? So therefore, uh, therefore, you have to be very careful how to do this, yeah? like in spy movies. Um, uh, again, the idea is now that since the public keys are very large, it becomes handy to use the hash value of your public key uh, to more or less send shorter strings around. So if people type it in, uh, they don't, you know, if the IBAN number is very difficult even for me to type it in. Um, if you now have hash values, they are even a little bit longer. But if you take the full public key, it's very hard to type it in if you do this manually. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> there is also a discussion now here about public keys may be vulnerable to quantum computing attacks. Uh, I think there will be a short discussion at, at the end of this session um, because you know there's this idea of quantum computing, or not only the idea, there's the technology of quantum computing, and there are algorithms which work on quantum computers, um, which can be theoretically as they uh, executed, yeah, once the quantum computers scale, currently they cannot be executed by that because they don't scale so much. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion, which I don't want to start dive into, uh, how long it takes that quantum computer can really do break uh, very large uh, uh, public keys. Yeah. So therefore, there's a certain risk at some time in the future uh, that these public key schemes may be broken. Yeah. And therefore, there's also some work in the cryptographic area, which again, I don't want to cover in detail, um, that maybe um, this approach is uh, vulnerable to quantum computing attacks. Um, but again, it's, it's always a matter of size, yeah, because if you increase the size of something, even for quantum computer, um, uh, it, this has an effect on the uh, runtime of these algorithms. But again, we have now a very ni nice new colleague uh, since I think uh, four months who is expert in quantum computing. And if you have questions regarding this, ask him because I'm not an expert here. Okay, um, so therefore, again, and the trick again is to validate that, this, that you are the owner of this public identity. You have to more or less then use your private key and do some uh, message validation yeah, so that you can really prove this is you. Um, yeah, okay, I already mentioned it while passing. Um, so it's very easy to create a lot of identities. Um, let's say if you have a game uh, or you want to have a, create a banking system or you want to create uh, identities for trading or identities for patients, um, that's very easy to create them. It's easy to validate them. Uh, and you don't need a central directory of all patients, uh, which typically is the case uh, you, if you have, let's say, a web application, you always have a directory of all users, uh, and these users are validated more or less by a list of email addresses or a list of usernames, which have to be unique. And the unique check requires people to, um, that you have a directory of all existing um, user IDs. Um, Okay, so therefore all cryptocurrencies and blockchain-based systems use this decentralized identity management. Also, what we will see that we want to have a lot of identities also for devices. Yeah, so that might be uh, if you have a bulb, a light bulb in your room, and it should have an address that you can talk to it, and it can more assign messages that it has seen some uh, or has done some uh, things uh, or has received some information. Uh, then uh, also you want to have a lot of uh, identities. Uh, okay. So, again, yes, the address of your wallet, more or less, or the address of your account is the hash of the public key you use for signing messages. Okay. Um, yeah. And again, what I already mentioned, you may have multiple wallets. Uh, or multiple identities, uh, and let's say as a, as, a, as a private person, if you do gambling or uh, illegal <laughs> things, uh, you want to have maybe another address or you want to have another address for um, uh, your business work or for traveling, etc. Yeah, so 
And again, as usual, you can have also lots of bank accounts in Germany, but after a while, it gets difficult to know which, how much money is on which bank accounts. And sooner or later, you start to transfer money between your bank accounts, which also would allow, if you have now a traceability of all transactions, to find out, yeah, somehow there might be the same person doing uh, having access to this. Yeah. It cannot be proven, but uh, it gives some indication if these three orders always do something, uh, move, move over money or information between them. Okay, um, to sum up, as a final, let's say, digression. Um, so here, here this, this uh, signature schemes. Um, so uh, if you have interchange factorization, they can be solved with a uh, four algorithm uh, using en enough powerful quantum computer. Now that has already been proved, I think, 20 years ago. Uh, there is also, but there's another positive result that hash functions are relatively secure across quantum computers. So it, can be proven also for quantum computing uh, um, based uh, algorithmic models. Uh, it's, uh, there's the complexity of uh, uh, breaking hash functions is very high. Yeah? This has been shown in 2009. And this has now obvious implications yeah, that let's say uh, whatever you use signatures, it's only a matter of time that also quantum computers will break it. Yeah? And the question is how nervous you will become about this because before, uh, before these things break, all banking systems will break and all uh, credit card systems will break. Uh, so therefore there will be a phase like the year 2000 problem uh, 20 years ago that everybody sees this problem coming and before it happens the pressure raises uh, um, is increased that you move all your existing data structures now and recode them uh, using uh, quantum resistant algorithms. Uh, but currently this is so far away, it's like the climate change, as so everybody is saying, yeah, we see the problem, but it's not today. Um, okay, uh, the question is now, what does it mean for the decentralized identity management system? And again, uh, if, if it's based on factorization, it could be bro uh, broken. Um, there is one way you could work, uh, uh, circumvent it. Um, so for example, for Bitcoin, that you even if you use the existing Bitcoin system, let's say after the quantum computer are very uh, uh, powerful, uh, one approach would be that uh, you only use each wallet once. Yeah? So therefore for each transaction, you would create a new wallet uh, so that even if one transaction would be broken, yeah? so if during the verification of the transaction, um, you um, have to reveal your public key, uh, and not only the hash value of your public key, uh, that now a quantum computer could try to break, compute from the public key, your private key. Um, but then uh, if you use the next time that you don't use the account again, then you could move money around in the Bitcoin to other accounts um, and then move, uh, again do the same thing again. Uh, but that it would not be a very, I think, uh, um, how would you say, you have to change your behavior of using wallets because currently the best, uh, the classical thing is you um, change money into a one wallet, which is then also kept on some uh, uh, public websites uh, or some cloud websites, which more or less manage your account. Yeah, so that's, uh, we will talk about this later. And uh, all these, uh, let's say, central exchange systems would be broken more or less yeah, because they reuse your account that you more or less can change bitcoins into real money and real money into bitcoins and always using the same um, wallet. And you would have to change drastically your behavior uh, in order to avoid uh, the quantum computing attacks. Okay, but again, this is a little bit hypothetical, so therefore I don't want to spend too much time. Are there any questions regarding now these cryptographic um, basics? Okay. Let's mention the Fragen. Um, so we got some questions on Tweetback. Um, first of all, um, wouldn't it be important for blockchains in the future that losing the private key does not mean that you lose all your money or tokens? Are there already solutions how to store private keys in a secure manner, but without the disadvantage or a broad user group? We will come to this later, how to store uh, private keys. Um, That's a separate section. Uh, it, it basically, 
Yeah, it's like your birth certificate in Germany. Yeah? Uh, so, um, so um, okay, no, the other way around. So, as I mentioned, in, in blockchain-based systems, we want to get totally independent of the real world. Yeah? Because in the real world, there are always ways that you can go somewhere, you can deposit something at a notary. or So if you trust in public institutions and that you have uh, physical ways of going to one place and show yourself and, and let's say, uh, do a lot of uh, proving things that uh, this is you, you are Kaspar Hauser, you have been found in those woods and you lost your memory or whatever, there will be a lot of ways with, with gene testing, etc., to re re recover your identity. And if you recover your real identity, then you can go to, go to banks and then with a the court, you can get access with a very tedious way, access to your accounts. Our goal of the, or the extremist point of view of Bitcoin based systems is, this is all shit. Yeah, we should get rid of the real world. We should do everything in the digital universe in provably mathematical ways. Yeah, and if you do this, then there's no way for you if you lost your private key to recover it. Yeah, because uh, uh, so therefore the only way is more like having lots of backup copies of your uh, private key. And then if you have too many backup copies, you have a question in the physical world, uh, how do you keep this backup copy safe? Is it on paper? Is it in a safe? Uh, is it online? Is it offline? And we'll discuss this later. Yeah? But it's more or less a question, let's say, of identity management in the real world, yeah? where it's all about there's a human person which can talk and speak, uh, and which has a genome, and which has some uh, visual appearance, and which is a certain location, and has a certain shape, uh, which allows to recover their identity and uh, with the history and uh, the proof of other people in a socially uh, constructed way. But in a mathematical way, there's no way around it. If you lost your private keys, they are gone. Yeah. Does this answer the question? I think so. Um, the second question we received is, what's the name of the colleague with the quantum computer expertise? Oh, uh, oh, don't ask me. Uh, let's just check it. Um, you, you, do quantum, you do the same thing what I'm doing now. It's a quantum computation term. Um, uh, uh, we, it's I a young, we publish I don't know, it's, it's yeah. a young, it's a young uh, colleague, ten, a tenure track professor who has a physics degree, uh, Mendel, Mendel, I don't know, and he started four months ago. If you go to the website of TUM um, faculty, there is a, a news entry uh, that he gave his um, inaugural lecture uh, on quantum computing. Yes. And I have to admit, I think 80% of the professors in the inaugural lecture were uh, saying this is very interesting research, but they were not able to follow. Um, but that's what is a secret that you keep for yourself. Okay. Very good. Um, so one question about the final version of the current slide set. So um, I omitted two slides from the current, um, from the uploaded version on Moodle because it was the answer slides to um, the questions we asked in the lecture and I will upload them separately so they will be there. Um, the next question is how do you change your address? How would you change an address if you own one? Why should I want to do this? I don't know. Maybe um, your keys are likely to be, get compromised. So, um, in terms of changing your address, there is no. So hey. you can create no. an indefin indefinite amount of um, addresses, and switching one address to another is basically you have to transfer all your possessions, like Bitcoin or other tokens, towards this new address. So that's not that's not really an issue. I think. No, yeah, it's, I, no, I think, so you, you, So if you talk about money, it's easy to shift money from one thing to the other. But if you typically, what you're doing is that uh, if you have a certificate, for example, uh, if you have a certificate, we use also uh, blockchain-based systems for, for digital certificates that you say, oh, this person uh, has a computer science degree or this person uh, has these capabilities, has make, taken this exam or this person uh, never had coronavirus in his life or had, had, has a certificate that he has corona, he's corona resistant. Yeah, so therefore what you often do is that you attach 
properties, yeah, your age, your gender, your income, your health status, uh, your, your, your education, uh, to your identity. Yeah? And therefore, obviously, identity theft is a very critical thing. And so therefore, what you need then later on is ways of uh, making change of uh, provenance of identity. That you say, this person now uh, has changed his name, has maybe a girl uh, married a man, or the man took on the name of the wife. Um, then you have to have a, a chain of certificates saying uh, that they are the same person, uh, but they now use a different uh, identity uh, or they have a different address. And then you can more or less trace back from the address. For example, the Deutsche Post keeps a track who moved from which address to which other address. Yeah. So that's, I think there is a tra track record that ties together and it has to be, again, cryptographically saved, secured, that these uh, identities have been moved yeah, and that certain uh, assurances to these identities are now valid also for the other identity. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, one of the basic problems we have now also in, in establishing uh, blockchain-based systems, but all, or all secure payment systems, is what is establishing such chains of trust uh, based on these cryptographic uh, uh, anchors. Yeah? And that's, I think, also a topic we do in our research, in our practical projects, to do this identity management and do this um, attribution of uh, values to these identities. Um, because that also has implications. You can make it very secure, but it should also be convenient. So that's also a, a, quant, a, a design problem, yeah? a software design problem or system design problem. What are good ways of establishing such universal systems of, let's say, assigning land to people, assigning uh, assets to people? Yeah? And therefore, it's a very interesting problem because you always have this additional constraint to do it in most uh, in a decentralized way, yeah? because currently it's always the state. Yeah? Germany it all goes back to the state, and if the state hates you <laughs> and doesn't want to have you, or maybe like in the US, the state doesn't want to have certain people to have an identity, because that gives you a lot of pressure on these people, like the immigrants, um, uh, then you have these political issues. So therefore, a lot of the blockchain-based research uh, has social and political implications. Okay. Very good. So, so, no, then. so we have resolved the question, who is the colleague? It's Professor Christian Mendel. Yeah, Christian. Yeah, it's Christian Mendel. He's a nice guy, very smart. And I think also he, so he, in the inaugural lecture, he just mentioned what cool stuff he did. Um, uh, but maybe if in, the, in the lectures, he will maybe do it piecewise and not for the colleagues. Uh, so visit the courses to learn more about quantum computing. Uh, actually, my daughter also studied quantum computing in Manchester and is now in Oxford, but she um, had worked a little bit at um, uh, IBM in Zurich, um, Colossus CERN. Um, uh, but I think she then also stopped continuing working on that. Um, but we have nice photos of her standing next to this quantum computer and with a t-shirt of a quantum computer. So maybe you should ask my daughter about details here.